The talk will have four parts. I'll speak first to the field of international history and the multifaceted understanding it has yielded of the significance of the League of Nations, and second to my own work on how the League sought to reconcile internationalism and imperialism. I'll then discuss one crisis I wasn't able to analyze in my book, the Italo-Abyssinian War, the war that not only destroyed the League's collective security system, but which I'll argue was a legitimation crisis and a tipping point for the international order as a whole. I'll look at the efforts of the powers to resolve this crisis through the old imperial methods and turn at the end to how publics mobilized and doomed that effort. Let me now turn to the new portrait of the League that has emerged over the past 20 years. Why did we start looking back at the League of Nations? Well, let's remember the world of the 1990s. The wall had just come down, the Soviet Union had collapsed, the Cold War had ended. The US was the only hegemon left, but a weakening one, for China and India were rising and the European Union consolidating. So the world of the 1990s felt multipolar, uncertain, but hopeful too. A new world order seemed to be emerging. There were new democracies and new democratic movements. There was a new language of economic globalization, but also one of human rights. The world of the 90s didn't feel much like 1945, and our eyes were drawn back to 1919, another moment of hope and global remaking, and to the institutions it birthed, especially the League of Nations. That scholarly turn to Geneva might have seemed quixotic because what we know about the League is that it was supposed to prevent the Second World War and spectacularly failed to do so. We have explanations for why it failed, because the Americans didn't join, because it was too idealistic, because it promised collective security but had no military, because its disarmament conferences went nowhere. But in averting our eyes from its failures, could we have paid too little attention to its longer lasting effects? The First World War had thrown up global problems of refugees, famine, cholera, financial collapse, and states beset on all fronts through those problems at the League. A first dividend of this new research was an awareness of the League's role in generating new institutions norms, and practices of global governance. It intervened to stabilize the Austrian economy after the failure of the Credit Anstalt. It pioneered development missions to China and Liberia, and it sought to regulate a host of other cr cross-border threats or traffics. Okay, I'm gonna just show a couple of slides. This is the conference program from Patricia's and my conference. Okay, cross-border traffics, radio waves, air travel, river navigation, capital flows, epidemic diseases, refugees, organized crime, double taxation, prostitution, opium, and so much else. Had the League's budget, by half the League's budget by the late 30s went to such work, often done in collaboration with what we would now call NGOs. And the institutions it built proved lasting. UNESCO, ECOSOC, the World Health Organization, the UN High Commission for Refugees, the Bank of International Settlements, and a host of other international bodies grew out of League precedents. We paid attention to, to a second major innovation of the League, the creation of an international civil service. The peacemakers first imagined the League as an alliance of great powers. And they thought that all substantive work would be done by officials from those states. But the first Secretary General, the career British Foreign Office official, official Sir Eric Drummond, remarkably broke with that vision. The Secretariat, he decided, would be organized by function, not nation, with separate sections devoted to each part of the League's work, that is to disarmament, economics, international law, information, social questions, health, mandates, and so forth. It would be staffed 
by an independent bureaucracy drawn from all member states, open to equally to men and women, and bound by an oath of loyalty to the League, uh, to the Covenant itself. This vision has lasted into the United Nations and nothing was more quietly revolutionary. Although the League Secretariat had its time servers and spies, most visitors to Geneva were struck by the idealism and competence of the Secretariat, its members lastingly loyal to the international project they were appointed to uphold. This is the League cartoonist Derso and Kellen and um, the, the leaders of the Secretariat, the heads of the Secretariat walking through the parted waves of um, all the crises that are hitting the world in 1931. Scholars have recovered, too, the extent to which the League engaged the world's peoples as they emerged from a maelstrom of destruction. And while the League would disappoint, this is because hopes ran so high. The League played to the crowd, its publicness being, I think, its third truly innovative aspect. The annual three-week meeting of the Assembly was an extravaganza covered closely by an enormous German uh, League press corps, that's the assembly, sorry, an enormous League journalists press corps. The information section was the largest as well, and the League had its own radio station. It published its minutes and agreements, and it sent copies to anyone who asked. Plenty of people did ask. So popular a cause was the League that some two million private individuals joined one of a dozen of dozens of societies formed for its defense. For these loyal supporters, the League was a post box to which anyone could send a complaint, a door on which anyone could knock. And knock they did. In 1921, the African-American public intellectual W.E.B. Du Bois brought the demands of the Second Pan-African Congress to Geneva. In 1923, Chief Deske of the Iroquois Six Nations arrived to contest Canada's claim to represent his people. A few years later, the Samoan independence movement arrived, sent its leader Olaf Nelson to ask that New Zealand be stripped of its right to rule their land. They brought heartbreak to Geneva too, the people, in 1936, the Czech Stefan Lux shot himself in the League Assembly to protest its inaction in the face of German militarism and anti-Semitism. It was these aspects of the League, its transnationalism, its secretariat, and its publicness that made it such a novel experiment in international relations. For the League didn't so much solve problems as internationalize them. But if this internationalization gave the League its allure, it also made it unstable. For if the League was a popular cause, its policies were still set by states. There is often a tension in global politics between transnational ideals and state interests. But with the League, those tensions were particularly sharp. For if the League proclaimed itself an alliance of equal and sovereign states, it was born in an age of empires at a time where much of the world was still under imperial rule. And if the League was to keep the peace then, that peace was a particular settlement established by the imperial powers riding a wave of anti-imperial feeling and of claims for self-determination. The order they created was thus international but still imperial, one that articulated an ideal of, the sover of sovereign equality, but imposed what we might call damaged sovereignty on some nations and denied sovereignty to others altogether. How could those decisions be justified? I'll turn to the second part of this talk. The League administ administered two innovative and consequential regi regimes set up to do that. The first was the minorities protection regime applied to a host of new polities carved out of defeated or uh, dissolving land empires of Central and Eastern Europe. Those states were born as nation states, states of Hungarians or Czechs or Poles. But because one couldn't unscramble the ethnic mosaic of Eastern Europe, of Central Europe, 
Most were anything but homogeneous. Only 70% of those in reconstituted Poland, for example, were ethnic Poles. As the price of sovereignty, the Allies thus required these states be granted cultural and linguistic right, grant cultural and linguistic rights to their ethnic minorities, who they hoped would then be loyal to their new governors. But by identifying minorities as the bearers of rights, the regime also stoked minorities' grievances, thus undermining the very borders they sought to stabilize. By the mid-30s, the minorities' regime was in tatters. The second regime, the Mandates regime, was applied to those Ottoman and German territories seized in the First World War. The victors did not want to hand those territories back, but nor did they wish to accede to demands for self-determination. At the peace conference and at San Remo in 1920, the Allies thus agreed on their disposition. They allocated the former Ottoman Middle East to Britain and France, Germans, Germany's African territories to Australia, uh, to Britain, France, Belgium, and South Africa, and Germany's Pacific territories to Australia, New Zealand, and Japan. Most reluctantly, they also set up an apparatus to supervise their administration. My most recent book, about which you've heard already, is a history of that system. What I argue in that book is that the mandate system was not a halfway house between imperial rule and independence. It was something different, an attempt to construct an international order that remained an imperial order. That is, to subject imperial rule to international agreement and international norms, based on the assumption that most of the non-white world was incapable of self-government and would remain so for a long time. The British led this effort, convinced that their model of indirect rule and paternalistic government was generalizable and best. Indeed, the norms which the system sought to generalize of paternalistic administration and the principle of the open door, free trade, were those which the British were most comfortable. To the imperial powers who promised to abide by those norms, the League offered approval. Their rule, legitimized as a sacred trust, exercised on behalf of those, as Article 22 of the Covenant put it, not yet ready to stand by themselves under the strenuous conditions of the modern world. And yet the League system, again, was unstable. Why was that? Well, it was because the very process of internationalization, of opening up the imperial order to discussion, didn't just facilitate imperial collaboration, it facilitated public discussion and anti-imperial collaboration as well. No one could have expected, for example, that the members of the Permanent Mandates Commission, the body appointed to review the Mandatory Powers Administration and question them about their work, would become a troublesome body for it was composed largely of former colonial governors, and as you can tell from this picture, it was no group of wild-eyed radicals. But simply through its dogged work, it uncovered much folly and corruption, and it was supported, moreover, by a diligent staff who researched tricky questions, wrote reports, and sent the Commission's minutes and decisions to anyone who would ask. Worse, from the imperial powers point of view, under pressure from humanitarians, the League insisted on a petition process through which people under mandate or interested outsiders could appeal to the League if they felt the system's principles were being violated. Meet, for example, the members of the Syro-Palestinian Congress, gathered in Geneva in 1921 to expose France's dictatorial rule in Syria. Or meet Dantes Belgarde, Haiti's delegate to the League who leapt to his feet at the 1922 assembly to denounce South Africa's bombing of African pastoralists in the mandated territory of Southwest Africa. Acting as a magnet for complaint covered by a vigilant press, the mandate system thus became an engine for publicity and scrutiny. The League couldn't force empires to govern differently, but it made their rule visible and contested. When Germany entered the League in 1926, 
Criticism grew more stringent, for if Germany couldn't get its colonies back, it wanted to make sure that none of the powers now holding them would profit from them either. By the late 1920s, the system was thus behaving in a manner its founders had never intended as an awkward alliance of genuine internationalists and resentful revisionist states forced the League Council to rule that mandatory powers were not sovereign in territories under mandate and to defend the economic rights of ent to entry by other League states. Germany moved swiftly to purchase its former plantations, to build up its trade, and to expose any and all cases of misgovernment in the territories it once held. In this period, which Zara Steiner called the hinge years, I think we see the post-war world of governance through markets rather than empire emerging. But the depression and then the rise of the Nazi regime forced a change of course. As economic conditions wor worsened, not only did the revisionist states, Germany and Italy, demand colonial territories of their own, but the imperial powers too drew their colonial territories and independencies closer into their economic web. It was in this context that Japan moved into Manchuria and Italy into Ethiopia, both claiming they were doing nothing but bringing order to lawless lands just as Britain and France had done. They'd be happy, they said, to administer their con conquests under mandate norms, since they too were civilizing powers. I don't tell the story of the Manchurian crisis or the Italo-Abyssinian war in my book. The book was too long already, and I had to keep the project under control. But I always felt that the Italo-Abyssinian crisis was part of my story. For when Italy attacked Ethiopia, claiming it was also just civilizing a savage people, the League architects and supporters suddenly saw the mandate system for what it was, a mode of legitimating alien rule, not of reforming it. The imperial order could survive this crisis politically but not ideologically. The Italo-Abyssinian War was, in other words, the tipping point between a world of empires and a world of unequal states. The rest of this talk will seek to persuade you of this argument. Let me remind you of the bare outlines of the story. For the imperial powers, Abyssinia was a problem from the start. Why was that? It was because it was one of only two independent black states in Africa between the wars, Liberia being the other. But Abyssinia was free in a way Liberia was not, for it had no white protector. Emperor Menelik II having electrified the world by defeating Italy in 1896. To the imperial powers holding territory in the Horn of Africa, that is Britain, France, and Italy, that de defeat was anomalous and an affront, and over the next two decades, they would repeatedly meet to try to bring this state to heel. Geopolitical interests drove them. France needed a railway. Italy wanted an economic zone. But once the League was formed, humanitarianism played its role too, with Britain's delegate to the League in 1921 suggesting that Abyssinia be placed under mandate so as to stamp out its slave trade. Abyssinia showed it could adopt this language too, though, arguing that as a civilized and Christian power encircled by heathens, it should be a member of the League. In 1923, Abyssinia was admitted to the League. It encircled by, avaricious colony, uh, by colonies of avaricious empires, it sought to modernize fast. Its forward-looking regent, Rastafari, later Haile Selassie, invited foreign dignitaries and the foreign press into Addis Ababa for his coronation as Emperor Haile Selassie. He brought in foreign advisors, Belgians to train his army, the French to run his schools, and he sent envoys to Japan to solicit economic investment and military supplies. And in 1931, he invited the British Anti-Slavery Society in to construct a plan for the suppression of slavery. Had the global depression not intervened, this strategy might have been successful. This is a very similar strategy to what uh, King Chulalongkorn is pursuing in Siam, and it retains its independence. But after the 
After the slump, all imperial powers turned to protect their own economic and territorial sphere. The Nazi threat changed European calculations too. By early 1935, France was happy to sacrifice Ethiopia to keep Italy in the Allied camp. And when meeting with the Italians that April, 1935, British Prime Minister Ramsay MacDonald was so unclear or perhaps just so senile that Mussolini thought Britain had signed off too. By the time he learned otherwise, he was too reckless to change his mind. Okay, this is Ethiopia's problem. It's surrounded by these uh, colonies of other powers. On a, uh, October 3rd, 1935, Italian troops struck into, Ethiopia, uh, struck into Ethiopia, and by May 1936, they were in Addis Ababa. These are just a few slides of that conquest. The Italo-Ethiopian conflict thus landed in Geneva, with Ethiopia appealing to the League on October 5th, 1935, two days after the attack. This was the League's test case, the only case in which the procedures laid out in Article 16 of the Covenant were followed. The aggressor named, a League coordination committee set up, sanctions on Italy imposed by 51 member states. Of course, the League action was partial, for the Suez Canal was never closed and Italy's oil supplies were never cut off. Separate great power negotiations consider, continued alongside two, yielding in December a joint British-French proposal under which Abyssinia was asked to cede significant portions of its territory to Italy and to place further portions in an Italian zone. This is the Horleval plan. These Horleval proposals were supposed to stop the war but they evoked such a public outcry that they had to be abandoned. The result was the worst of all possible worlds. Ethiopia was destroyed, but Italy left the League and moved into alliance with Germany anyway. The League was fatally weakened, but nothing was put in its place. The world in 1937 was a distinctly more dangerous place than it had been in 1934. For the great powers, certainly, but especially for the many and vulnerable and small states who had looked to the covenant to safeguard their independence. The damage to the European security system caused by this episode is well understood, but the crisis also affected the project of imperial legitimation and reform that the League was trying to pursue. Italy's war on Ethiopia called what we might call framework trouble, precisely because Italy insisted that her war, too, was a civilizing endeavor against a backward, disorganized, slave-trading state. It insisted, that is, that Italian rule fit perfectly within the framework of the mandate system and the sacred trust. Imperial powers and publics were forced to ask, then, whether that claim was right. Was Italy's behavior no different from their own? The powers and the peoples answered this question differently. Let me take them in turn. When we think of the betrayal of Abyssinia by the great powers, we usually think of the Horleval Pact. Again, the secret agreement worked out by British Foreign Secretary Sir Samuel Hoare and the French Premier Pierre Laval. Since everyone knew Laval would do anything to keep Italy out of the German camp, the agreement destroyed Hoare's reputation in particular. He was forced to resign and would go down in history as the man who had sold Haile Selassie out. If we look closely at the diplomatic record, though, this characterization falls apart. For Hoare was appointed in July 1935 to stiffen up British policy after four years of Sir John Simon, possibly the worst foreign secretary in history. Simon had been so eager to keep Mussolini friendly when Hoare came to the Foreign Office and read through the record, he was shocked by his predecessor's defeatism. Britain had left, let Mussolini off far too lightly, Hoare said, and if it allowed Italy to move against Ethiopia, millions of colonial subject was, subjects would rightly lose all confidence in British rule. On taking office, Hoare met with the service chiefs to make sure Britain was prepared for war with Italy 
and at the League Assembly in September 1935, he proclaimed that Britain would fulfill its obligations under the Covenant. When Italy attacked anyway, he argued in Cabinet and to Laval for oil sanctions. Hoare, in other words, became the fall guy for a policy of appeasement that he had not authored. Others had worked it out before Mussolini even attacked. Who did that? Especially important was none other than Sir Eric Drummond, the League's first Secretary General, who had left Geneva in 1933 in exhaustion to become British ambassador to Rome. Here we have a puzzle. How could Drummond, a man who had given the best years of his life to the League, make the case for appeasing Italy? Let me take you into Foreign Office files to follow his thought. We need to recognize first that Foreign Secretary John Simon told Drummond that no Ethiopian question should be allowed to affect Anglo-Italian relations. The British consul in Addis Ababa strenuously disagreed with that policy, arguing that if England and France didn't firmly warn Italy against attack, it would surely attack. But Britain and France did not warn Italy. Not until May 1935, after Italy had moved hundreds of thousands of troops and thousands of tons of ammunition through the Suez Canal into Eritrea and Italian Somaliland, was Drummond told to warn Mussolini not to force Britain, quote, to choose between their old friendship with Italy and the support, their support of the League. But that very late warning, Drummond reported to Simon, just brought Mussolini completely into the open. Abyssinia was not a European question, Mussolini insisted, and the League's collective security regime should be confined to Europe alone. Abyssinia, Mussolini added, was, quote, a blot on civilization, a collection of tribes, all backward, some, he alleged, even cannibalistic. Abyssinia was not worthy of being a member of the League at all, so the League should not object if Italy tried to bring order and progress to such a state. Italy was, after all, just doing what the French had done in Morocco and the British in Egypt. This is the imperialist argument in its most unvarnished form, and Drummond probably didn't enjoy listening to it. But over the next 10 days, Drummond worked to fit Italy's argument into the logic of the sacred trust. On June 1st, 1935, he sent Simon a very long memo arguing for concessions to Italy. Italy, Drummond began, thought it had received less than its due at the peace conference. It thus claimed a right to colonial expansion and blamed Britain and France for holding it back. The British in particular were seen as hypocrites who secure in their vast empire evoked general principles to oppose Italy's claim. The Italian people had also been prepared assiduously for war through a press campaign harping on Abyssinia's barbarity, slave owning and warlordism. Italy, in other words, now justified its war as a civilizing mission, using language very like that of the League Covenant. But Drummond didn't just explain Italy's grievances, he justified them. Ethiopia had promised the Italians economic concessions, but hadn't followed through. The Italian colonies found the Abyssinians unruly neighbors, and then there was that, quote, question of slavery and barbarism. Drummond dilated on this classic justification of empire. That the Abyssinians were, quote, in spite of their Christian beliefs, in essence barbaric, few, I imagine, will be ready to deny. Abyssinia was, quote, an extremely backward country, far more backward than Syria or Iraq. And the peace conference had placed both Syria and Iraq under mandate rule under Britain and France. Civilizational hierarchy mattered more then than Ethiopia's sovereign rights. The League did need to keep the peace, Drummond argued, but it could only do so if great power interests were better aligned and territorial concessions to the, quote, have not great powers was necessary to bring about that alignment. Surely, Drummond wrote, all British statesmen would willingly grant Germany colonies to bring it back to Geneva, and if so, 
Italy deserved a larger empire as well. Admittedly, he said, turning Ethiopia, a League member, into a dependency presented, and I quote, peculiar difficulties, but Drummond wrote, and again I quote, I submit that the situation is so grave and the threat to the League so serious that every effort should be made to see whether, and if so, to what extent, it is possible to assist Signor Mussolini in the difficulties in which he now finds himself. To assist Signor Mussolini in the difficulties in which he now finds himself. It seems worth pausing on this fascinatingly indirect construction. Italian troops were poised on Ethiopia's borders north and south. But it was Italy, Drummond insisted, that found itself in difficulties and deserved Britain's aid. Drummond didn't think the great powers should just hand Ethiopia over, but he did think Italian hegemony could be established by degree, say by replacing all foreign advisors in Ethiopia with Italians and by allowing Italy to garrison troops there. Mussolini should thus be told that Britain would not tolerate forcible contact, conquest, but that it did want to help shift Ethiopia into Italy's sphere. And it should make it clear to Ethiopia that if the worst comes to the worst, neither Britain nor France, quote, has the slightest intention of backing her up. Drummond's memorandum, in other words, reconciled Italian ambitions and League principles if at the cost of making what in clear what internationalizing empire entailed. Peace was peace among the great powers, and if Ethiopia had to pay a price for that comedy, so be it. There were hierarchies of peoples and claims, and it had been a mistake to place Ethiopia in the civilized camp. Drummond's thinking echoed through the cabinet, with Neville Chamberlain noting that it wasn't Italy's desire to rule Ethiopia, which was only natural, but rather the desire to achieve that through force that Britain objected to. Should we be surprised that it is Chamberlain who would hand portions of Czechoslovakia to Germany to preserve great power agreement? But Drummond's effort at appeasement failed partly because Mussolini genuinely wanted war and attacked that October, but also because it aroused enormous international opposition. This is the fourth and final part of this talk. So why was that? Of course, imperial atrocities had aroused international censure before. Think of the campaigns against Leopold's brutal regime in the Congo, or the outcry over the Amritsar massacre. There are many such cases. But these imperial scandals were thought of as deviations from and not characteristic of imperial rule. The Italo-Ethiopian War was different. For many, it had, had undermined the imperial order as a whole. And it did this precisely because of the publicness that lay at the heart of the League project. For if Drummond's memoranda were secret and Hor Laval tried to keep their negotiations secret, League actions took place in public. Sanctions were imposed publicly, and the limits of those sanctions were public too. The war was a media extravaganza. 200 Italian journalists were embedded, as we would now say, with the Italian army. 170 accredited foreign correspondents were in Addis when the fight began. The war was photographed and filmed, and rival charges of atrocities winged their way around the world. By May, the war was largely, uh, by May, the war was ov largely over, in part because of Italy's use of bombardment and of poison gas. Italy, and I quote, would not have obtained success before the rains, this is the British War Office judging, if they had not resorted to gas warfare. So Ethiopia lost the war with Haile Selassie taking exile in England. But the media war, that Ethiopia unquestionably won. Anti-colonial and African diaspora groups protested early and in numbers, 
A hands-off Ethiopia movement sprung up in Harlem, Chicago, and elsewhere. In London, in the summer of 1945, before the war had even begun, George Padmore, C.L.R. James, and other diaspora anti-imperialists, anti-imperialist intellectuals formed the International African Friends of Abyssinia and later the International African Service. But demonstrations of support and solidarity campaigns sprang up across the colonies too, from Jamaica to Cairo to Natal. Colonial Secretary William Ormsby Gore had warned that Britain's failure to support Ethiopia would create, and I quote, a sense of rankling injustice and bitter anti-white propaganda throughout Africa. And it did. For black anti-imperialists, though, Italian aggression and Anglo-French collusion confirmed what they already knew. But sympathy for Ethiopia bubbled up in less expected quarters, too. The only arms that made their way to Ethiopia came remarkably from Germany, and the Japanese government found it hard to prevent not just students but army officers from supporting Ethiopia too. The conflict shattered the cherished assumptions long held by liberal internationalists as well. Liberal Britons thought of their empire as a defender of civilization. Now the Ethiopians were persuasively claiming that role. Indeed, once the news of Italian use of gas became widespread, it became hard to use the term civilization, except ironically. Punch printed cartoons about the black man's burden or showing barbarism as a peaceful village and civilization as a bombed and blighted moonscape. Even the Times put the words civilizing mission in scare quotes. When the Italians tried to resurrect that language at the close of their conquest, then it just didn't work. The French had urged Mussolini to promise to govern Ethiopia according to mandate rules. So Count Ciano, Mussolini's bombastic son-in-law, wrote the League promising that Italy's work in Ethiopia was, quote, a sacred mission of civilization. Italy would protect native well-being and suppress slavery, he said, a blot of infamy on the old regime. But against that note came the personal appearance of Haile Selassie at the assembly on June 30th. The Italian advance had been achieved primarily through gas attacks, Selassie pointed out, a very refinement of barbarism that had carried devastation and terror into the most densely populated parts of the country. All states of the world had an interest in repelling such brutality, for if it were allowed against Ethiopia, it would be allowed against other nations as well. Apart from the kingdom of God, there is not on this earth any nation that is higher than any other, Selassie said. Italy had done everything it could to protect, prevent Haile Selassie from speaking. Selassie was no longer a head of state and represented no one, they charged. But the assembly had not yet recognized the Italian conquest, and when it became clear that the guilt-ridden delegates would not bar him, Ciano distributed whistles to Italian journalists in the gallery. Selassie's first words were drowned out in piping and catcalls, but then the security officers bundled the Italians out. A la porte les sauvages, show, show the barbarians, that is, the Italians, the door, shouted the Romanian delegate. We can be in the hall for this episode, so I want um, to show up just a newsreel clip, if you can put it on. Okay. At the League of Nations, a grave disturbance. Today, Haile Selassie comes to plead for his lost empire. He wants them to make Mussolini give up Ethiopia. The Geneva crowds are for him, but the exiled emperor will need his imperturbable dignity before the day is over. British Foreign Minister Eden, Soviet Delegate Litvinov on the left, and French Premier Blum and all the statesmen, instead of helping Haile Selassie, have decided to lift the sanctions against Italy. The introduction of the emperor in English. <laughs> In the shadows of the press gallery, the newspaper men are ready for an outbreak against the emperor who's... 
country their country has taken, waiting for his first word. <laughs> Trying to quell the disturbance, lights turned out. Lights out. The disturber is ejected, arrested, and he is able to make his appeal. <laughs> An ovation, yes, but he gets no help. The league lifts the sanctions against Italy. Applause, and that's all. Okay. That's what happens when you use YouTube, but um, I think it's a remarkable thing just to have those uh, clips. All of the Pathé archive is also up on the web, so you have newsreels from everywhere through this whole period. Um, what we see perfectly performed here is that contradiction the League couldn't resolve. It was supposed to be an alliance of equal and sovereign states meeting openly and publicly to defend common norms and international law. This is why Selassie had to be allowed to speak. By the time he did, though, his country was occupied, for the League had no army, only the most powerful League states could have intervened. And they had concluded that they could preserve their own security and their empires by letting get Italy get away with it. Two years later, with the League system destroyed, they would again purchase peace by forcing a small country to cede territory. So I hope today I've persuaded you of the importance of this crisis as a moment when the tensions between a logic of equal sovereignty and a logic of empire was made visible and delegitimized. I want to close, though, with a comment about how the United Nations has and has not built on this League precedent. I mentioned at the opening that it has expanded international cooperation and the Secretariat. But how has it handled these method, me, matters of security and sovereignty? Certainly, the United Nations promoted decolonization and upheld the norm so unevenly applied by the League of self-government and state sovereignty for all peoples. As a, as a result, the United Nations, whoop, yeah, the United Nations has an enormous membership, 192 members, um, unlike the League, which was between 40, about 45 and about 58 most of the time. Nor do states leave the United Nations with impunity. But if the League has sustained sovereignty, this is partly because the nature of sovereignty has changed and it's become more constrained. And if it's managed to hold its members, even when they fight among each other, this doesn't mean it has figured out how to resolve those quarrels and conflicts. Yes, the United Nations, like the League, has sometimes imposed sanctions on so-called rogue states and has sent peacekeeping missions to conflict zones. But it has accepted, in fact if not in law, that security pacts will be regional, not global and it has ensured its survival by finding a mechanism through which to give great powers a degree of license, the degree of license they demand. This mechanism is the Security Council veto. The Italo-Ethiopian War broke the League, not just because a great power subjected a fellow League state, but because Italy was not able to keep the conflict off the international table, as great powers later would do. If the measure of success for international institutions is survival, the Security Council veto was a brilliant innovation. But it had a cost. 
which is that a small state attacked by a great power cannot really look to the United Nations for mediation or salvation. And I will leave you to decide whether this is progress. Thank you. Thank you.